Good morning, good morning. Everyone getting settled in, a little crisp outside, a little comfortable to some, maybe a little warm to some in here. We'll, we'll try to work through it and enjoy our worship together today. It's uh, hard to regulate the temps. Uh, I always uh, feel sorry for Doug these time of the year, spring and the fall, because just can't get it right for everybody, but he's going to do his best. Glad you're here to worship in this morning, our Bible study time period. Do we have a good number here, and uh, thank you for making it and um, kicking off our meeting in a good way this morning. Brother Bill Greer is with us, his wife Sylvia made the journey as well from Chattanooga, not that far up the road. Many of you have visited there many times, I'm sure, and a uh, nice little city. I was having chit-chat with him about the his- history there and some of the enjoyable sights uh, that people take in when they visit there. Bill has uh, basically been there all of his life, you might say. He's uh, preached for the Saudi Church of Christ there in uh, Saudi Daisy, Tennessee, since 1984. So uh, that always speaks well, uh, you know, of a man that can stay that long at one congregation, I think. And uh, he's certainly well respected there, I'm sure, or they just can't get rid of him, one of the two, you know. But the old joke about that, but I'm sure he's doing a good job there, and that's commendable for Bill. He's also served in the eldership of that congregation, and um, <clears throat> in 2009, he retired from dentistry after 40 years of practice. So um, uh, if you got any questions about your dental plate or something, he may be able to answer it today. He received his formal education from Red Bank High School in 1962 in the University of Tennessee in Chattanooga. Uh, he got his B.A. in 67. University of Tennessee College of Dentistry in 69. He served on the board of directors at Boyd Buchanan uh, High School there in Chatt- Chattanooga and Greater Chattanooga Christian or, or Children's Home and Christian Services. He's led singing for several meetings, so I've got the pressure on today there. Good, good preacher and a good leader as well, and we look forward to his participation this week in our singing and uh, some other campaigns he's led in. He served as a, a panelist on the Know Your Bible television program and sponsored which is sponsored by the Churches of Christ in the Chattanooga area. And he's frequently on different lectureships as a speaker. He is, his wife, Sylvia, they've been married for 45 years and have two children and four grandchildren. So hope you'll, uh, in a moment, give your attention to Brother Bill Greer and um, feel free to interact with him. In two or three days, he'll be with us here for the meetings and have special activities today planned, as you know, with our luncheon and services again at 1 o'clock. Before we turn it over to Brother Greer, though, I'll ask Rick Presno if he will lead us in opening prayer. Father in heaven, we praise your name for this wonderful day you've given us, for the blessings of just being here with other Christians. But Father, we thank you so much more for your gift of your son for the gift of love that you had and the love that he showed us in his sacrifice upon the cross. Father, we ask your blessings upon this time that we meet this morning to open your word. Father, it's our prayer that our hearts are receptive to your word, that we receive the word and apply it in a positive way. Father, we pray for this time that we have for this gospel meeting. We we pray that we'll all be here And we'll be supporting this effort. Father, we pray that those that need to hear the gospel will hear it and and receive the gospel and respond to it. Father, we thank you once again for this time that we have. We pray your blessings upon this congregation, just blessings upon Brother Greer. We thank you for the time that he spent uh, preparing for this, the time that... He spends up here for us. We ask your blessings upon him. Father, there are many of this congregation that are suffering illnesses, difficulties, and trials. Father, we pray your your blessings upon them. Father, once again, we thank you for this time that we have. Be with us during this study. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, class, are you ready? I've got some books. We're not going to be using much except the Bible. It's an honor to be with you and a part of this meeting this week. I thank the elders of this congregation for their confidence in me and allowing me to come and be a part of their gospel meeting this week. We're going to focus on our Christianity during the most part of this week. 
Most folks who attend church services like this are already members of the church, and that's good. But we need to be encouraged, we need to be motivated, we need to be rekindled in our fire and enthusiasm for Christianity. I've been a Christian for 55 years, and I trust that I've gained some maturity and some spirituality, and I'm closer to heaven now than I was when I began. And that's my purpose in preaching and teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. I asked this morning in our Sunday school class that we have the high school class and the teenagers in here for a very particular reason. We live in a time when not, peop- not many people have much regard for God at all. When you look at polls that people take, a lot of people don't even believe in God anymore. So I want to title this lesson in our Sunday school class this morning, There is a God. You probably sing that song, don't you? There is a God, He is alive. It's in your songbook. Written by Brother A.W. Dykus. He grew up and had relatives in the Chattanooga area. They still some of his family go to the Ridgedale congregation there. He was a Ph.D. in physics. He taught at TPI, which is now Tennessee Technological Institute. When, and he, he was there when he wrote this song, There is a God, He is Alive. Third verse says, Secure is life from mortal man. God holds the germ within his hand. Though men may search, they cannot find, for God alone does understand. Yes, there is a God. Man has tried to take God out of his life and take God out of every equation to bring it down to the scientific realm. And I can't see God physically because he's supernatural. He's not physical. He's not made of physical things. So the world says, well, since I can't see him, I can't prove him, then he must not be there. And we've turned our backs upon God. That's why we are where we are as a society, as nations today, and as a religious people today. My guess is you've noticed, if you've been a member of the Lord's Church very long, people are not beating the doors down to get here. And as a matter of fact, some who are here are leaving going to other religious organizations, going to some that are less stringent, less relying upon the book. And as a result, we struggle as Christians. And sometimes we get discouraged. Now, I was, I was, I was mentioned in the introduction, I've studied science all my life. There's never been a time when I was in high school and college when I was not taking a math course and science course at the same time. Most of the time in college, I was taking three science courses at the same time. I didn't always like them, but I studied science. I'm saying this to give you a background of what things we're going to be talking about this morning. I hold two books in my hand. This one you recognize, the Holy Bible. This one's a whole lot heavier. Biology, 8th edition, published in 2009. This is the textbook used today at the University of Tennessee in Chattanooga in biology classes. One of our young men at the Saudi Church I, let me borrow his book. Now, let me ask you, talk about science. Does anybody know what the word science means? Just the derivation word science? It comes from a Latin word, scio, S-C-I-O, to know. Science is knowledge. Now listen carefully. Everything that science can prove as true, I believe and accept 100%. For instance... If I let go of this book right now, does anybody know what's going to happen? Yes. It's going to fall down. Why? Because of the law of gravity. Now, I can throw it up, but the law of gravity still works. It's going to pull it towards the force. The force pulls towards the center of the universe, of of the earth. We understand that. Everything that science can prove, I believe, and it will never conflict with the Word of God. People say, oh, this book here, that's just a bunch of old fairy tales and myths made up by people over a long period of time. But this book tells me holy men of God spake as they were moved. That means born along under the influence of, just as surely as this is under the law of gravity, this is under the law of God. As they were influenced by the Holy Spirit of God. The truth of science will never contradict the Bible. The truth of the Bible will never contradict science. Now I sat under many college professors who did not believe in God. I can still remember the day in the room in the fall of 1962 when I went to the university. It was just the University of Chattanooga at that time. Brilliant professor, uh, 101 biology. Second day of class, he let us know he does not believe in God. He's dead now. He did not believe in God. And just walked on from there with it. Now, I've been in church all my life. I've been in science all my life. And when he said that, I got to thinking. 
Well, now, he's a brilliant man. He's head of the department. He's got a Ph.D. and credentials. And he says there's no God. Could it be that what my mother and daddy have been telling me and the Red Bank Church of Christ have been telling me all my life is really not true? And I would lay awake at night. You know, I remember when I believed there was a Santa Claus. And then I would lay awake at night and wonder, is that really true? Take that same mindset to God. Is there really a God? Dr. Fry is so brilliant, he's got to be right. And that was fed to me all those years. And when you folks, you know, young folks go off to college, it's going to be crammed down your throat. And not only in science classes, but a lot of other classes too, because most of the intelligentsia elite folks today don't believe in God. That's foolish. That's mythological. I'm here to show you today from this book. If I can pick it up. This book. That this book is true. Now then, again I said everything that science can prove, I will never argue with. Because science means knowledge. It's true. But nothing that science guesses about, hypothesizes about, necessarily is true. When it's proven as true, we can accept it. But you see, I can take this book, because this is the book from the one who created the universe. In the beginning, God created, verse 1 of the book, the heavens and the earth. The word create comes from a Hebrew word that means, listen, to bring into existence from nothing. How do you do that? Now somebody created this book, the paint, the ink, the paper, all that kind of stuff, but they had something to start with. You start with something and make something else. Somebody made this table here. They started with something and made something else out of it. This time wearing, they started with something and made something out of it. God started with nothing and made it all. God being completely perfect can set it all into action. All the rotation of the earth around the sun and our solar system all throughout the universe and maybe there are other universes out there, I don't know. God has the power to speak them into existence. Now then, I want to show you today from the science book the fallaciousness and the not really academic education used in discussing the idea of evolution. The word evolve means to gradually unfold. This building, about been here 15 years now, gradually unfolded. You started out with some concrete blocks and a foundation, then wood superstructure built on and on and on. It gradually evolved from a piece of blank dirt into a building. That's the evolution, a change, evolving, going from one thing to the next. But now science, since they can't understand the beginning, have to come up with some hypothesis or idea or guess about how all that happened. And so the theory of evolution. Now, evolution, again, is the process of changing from one thing to another. Have you noticed how television sets have evolved? Cell phones have evolved? When I was a kid and growing up in Red Bank, we had one phone only five digits to dial the number. You had to stick your finger in there and do that. Boy, that was hard work. But we were on a party line. Three other families had the same number. The old folks remember that, don't you? But it has evolved now to this little thing in your pocket. You push all buttons or my wife can push them for me and I can get the phone. It's evolved. Listen carefully. You have noticed that evolution always is going in an uphill situation. We started out with simple forms of life. And then they came out of the mud and they became able to walk and they evolved legs and crawled along and then they evolved arms and legs and wings and, and poof, here we are. Over four or five billion years of age in doing that. Notice this. If you believe the theory of evolution, evolution is starting from a lower position and building to a more complex situation. Understand? Start out with just a few cells, it gradually evolves into something more and more and more. It's growing and getting bigger. Science says that is impossible. In science, there are two laws called the laws of thermodynamics. Heat, energy transfer. Those of you in science students have heard those terms. Law number one of thermodynamics says 
and this is it's a law of science they can prove this matter can neither be created nor destroyed in other words there's only so much stuff here so many atoms protons molecules whatever terms you want to use so much of it and the law says it cannot be created or destroyed law number two says it's simply distributed to something else you take hydrogen and oxygen two, two, two atoms of hydrogen one atom of oxygen mix them together you've got water H2O but you've still got the same number of stuff same amount of stuff the second law of di- thermodynamics says that every time there is a electrical or chemical or physical reaction the matter or the energy becomes less available for use You fill your car up with gasoline, you drive 20 miles, it's got less gasoline than it is when you started, isn't it? It's going downhill. Gas gauge is moving down. So that proves to us, and this is a scientific law, not a guess, that the earth is winding down. It's not winding up. That's why our calendar year gets a little bit longer every year. A few seconds, a few minutes, every year it gets a little bit longer and a little bit longer. That's why we are gradually, in our orbit around the sun, moving further and further away from the sun. That's why the moon is moving further and further away from the earth. And scientists can calculate this and prove this. The law of thermodynamics. And again, everything that science can prove, I will never disagree with it, because it will never contradict the Word of God. Now then, this idea of evolution. I have a copy of Charles Darwin's book, The Origin of the Species. Charles Darwin was not a scientist. In his own writings, he says he did not claim to be a scientist. He lived over in England and Scotland in that area, and he went on a voyage, the voyage of the Beedle on that big ship went all over the earth. And over the years, he, he grew up kind of as a Catholic, uh, uh, in a Catholic monastery that kind of a background, religious background. So while he was on this voyage, he gathered samples of different plants and animals and all those kinds of things. And he did that so that he could come up with how it all began. Now I think it's interesting to notice about Charles Darwin. This scientific textbook in use today at the University of Chattanooga makes this statement. That's all right, let it go. Evolution, this is page two of the book. It's right in the first page, right the first look. In this chapter, we will introduce three basic themes of biology. Evolution. He goes on to talk about what evolution is. And mentions all these things about evolution. Talking about Darwin. Darwin's book raised a storm of controversy in both religion and science, some of which still lingers. Yes, thank goodness it does. I want you to notice from Charles Darwin's book a couple of statements that he makes that I think are very fundamental to us. First of all, he has a whole chapter entitled Difficulties of the Theory. This is Charles Darwin's writing. He comes up with the theory, again, not a law, but a theory that we evolved from lower forms of life. But he says he writes a whole chapter here on difficulties of the theory. He has another chapter involved, the imperfections of the geological record. You see, most people today in science, when they date something, they go down and dig down into the earth, and say, well, the rocks down here are this age. You go down a little further, a little bit older, a little bit further, a little bit older. And so they come up with all these years. And we'll talk about more of that scientific dating in a minute. But here's the kicker in Charles Darwin's book. The very last sentence of the book. There is a grandeur in this view of life, of evolution, with its several powers, having been originally created by the Creator, capital C. Darwin believed in God. He wasn't trying to disprove God. He was trying to figure out what God had already done. But he could not do that completely. But he calls it a theory. And he acknowledged the fact that there is a God. But now notice, oh, and incidentally, Charles Darwin, as you know, in in the state of Tennessee, Dayton, Tennessee, 1925, that's the next county up from our house in Hamilton County. Dayton County Courthouse, 25 miles from where we live. The trial in 1925, Dayton, Tennessee, that John Scopes called the monkey trial. Because here was a man who was teaching evolution in the state of Tennessee, and they said it was against the law at the time. And so they had the trial. Incidentally, the last surviving juror on that trial was one of my mother's uncles. So we had a a connection there. But here's here's what I want you to notice from this, this book. Talking about evolution. I'll just make a quick quick quote. Chapter 18 begins with the introduction of the 
Darwinian evolution. Now, everything that science can prove, as I said, I believe. Notice the words, the very first sentence. A great deal of evidence suggests that the biological diversity represented. He goes on and talks about, all the way through this thing, the origin and evolutionary history of life. First paragraph. The preceding three chapters were concerned with biological evolution. However, we have not dealt with what many regard as a fundamental question. How did life begin? So they're going to tell us in the biology book. Although biolo biologists generally accept the hypothesis that life developed from non-living matter, exactly how that process began is not certain. Even the textbook, they cram it down your throat as truth. The textbook says they're not certain. It's still a theory. But we have built an educational system around the fact that evolution occurred and that there is no God. You don't need God to explain the evolutionary process. He goes on, after the first cells originated, they diverged over several billion years. And you know how the, the earth has to be four and a half or five billion years old, so we'll talk about more in a moment. This page here, organic molecules form the primitive earth. First sentence, how they may have originated. The hypothesis proposes. Headline, organic molecules may have been produced. Organic molecules may have formed over and over throughout this book. It's not taught, it's not stated as fact, it's taught as theory, but then they want to cram it down our throats and make us think that this is exactly how it happened. Scientists, students, remember, if you forget everything else I said today, everything that science can prove, I can believe, and it will be in harmony with the Word of God. When science starts hypothesizing and theorizing, it might be right, but it might not be right. So then I've got to make a leap of faith. In which one of these books will I place my faith? Now on test day, I'm going to put the answer down the teacher wants. I'm smart enough to figure that one out, and y'all have to. But when it comes to my eternal destiny, where do I want my faith? In this book that has a lot of supposition and theory, and the idea that there's no such thing as God because you don't need a God, it all happened by natural forces? Or do we want to accept this because of what God says? Now, the earth has to have four and a half to five billion, and this textbook even mentions the fact of, of the year of possible 13 billion years for it to all got here. How could all this plan unfold like this? Again, going uphill when the laws of thermodynamics say it's going downhill. The Bible does not teach anything such as that age. Let me ask you this. On what day of creation was Adam made? Let me give you a hint. Sixth day. All right, math students. On day seven, how old was Adam? Six plus one. One day old. Who took care of him? One day old infants got to have... No. He was full grown, mature, developed. He could talk, he could think, he could act, he could gather the fruit. And he was only one day old. He was eating food that was produced on, was created on day three and four. Anybody ever put a tomato plant on one day and three days later get tomatoes off of it? No. It's got to grow and mature and develop. The point is, God made this earth full grown and mature at the end of six 24 solar hour days. Day seven, Adam was one day old. If you cut down a tree on day seven, it was three days old. It might have had 50 rings in it or 75 rings. We understand the appearance of age. Question. How on, on day seven, how old were the carbon molecules that, that scientists use to date things with today? Carbon-14. Seven days old. Created on the first day when God created the heaven and the earth. There it was. They were only six days old at that time, or seven days by, the, by then. But they had the appearance of age just like Adam, just like Eve, just like the fruit. Full-grown, mature. Therefore, the dating system would be skewed, wouldn't it? It can't read back to day one because everything is already full-grown and mature. Keep that in mind as you read the dates of things being millions and billions of years of age because of the age of the earth. My, and sometime in your private study, go back and look in Genesis chapter 5 and read the whole chapter. Genesis chapter 5 
is the only writing on planet earth the only writing on planet earth that gives you any information at all about planet earth before the day of the flood and it's quite interesting to know that you've got a chronology in there of how long Adam lived before he got these, these people and all the way down through those first seven generations the numbers are there you add them up you come up with something like 1,656 years, the age of the earth when the flood came. People laugh and scoff at that. But Genesis 5 is the only writing on planet earth that gives us that correct information. Science can't do it. It has to guess and suppose and think and maybe and might have, could have. The Bible is the truth from the Word of God. Now, if you want my opinion, I... Archbishop Usher said that the earth is now four, was created on, in October 4004 B.C. I don't know if we can tie it down that tightly. But we have a relatively young earth. This earth, 6,000 years old, 5,000, 6,000, something like that. How then do the scientists come up with all these big numbers? They go back to the fossils, don't they? Digging up fossils. If you cut down a tree and just let it lie there, it's going to finally just deteriorate and rot away, isn't it? It's going to take it several years to do that. You take an animal and just leave the carcass there and it'll rot away, but it's going to take it a long time to do that. There's an event in Genesis chapter 6 and 7 called the flood. You remember that story? And it rained on the earth for 110 days, solid. That's a lot of water. All your creeks down here are high right now. They are in Chattanooga also because of the last just three or four inches of rain. You'll also notice as you read Genesis chapter 6 and 7 that the waters came down from heaven, but it also says the fountains of the deep opened up. Earthquakes, if you will. They shook the very foundation of the earth. Water and liquid comes up from the earth. So you've got water coming down and water coming up. That's how you can flood the entire world. That's the only way you can do it. Now then, what happened when the fountains of the deep opened up and the waters come down from above? You've got land mass changes. The ground is upheaval, if you will, in upheaval. And you get the, the ability now, we see the mountain ranges. You've got Mount Everest over 29,000 feet high. You've got the Dead Sea goes down under about 1,300 feet below ele uh, sea level elevation. That didn't happen all by accident or chance. It happened by the flood. All the things that were on earth at that time with except Noah and his family and the animals on the ark, destroyed. Now it starts raining, you go inside to stay dry. You, there's no inside to go to because the water's coming up from the inside. It's going to all cave in on itself. And there you have all those animals and all the rocks and all the trees squashed together in a big old pile of junk and it stays right there. And that's why you have places today where out in Montana they found saltwater fish in the fossils out there. That's the only explanation you can have for it. All because of the universal flood. That made complete turmoil and chaos in the world. And that's why you can have mountain ranges today that you dig into and you find all these different fossils. They didn't decay naturally. They were forced into that position. And the science textbooks are full of fossils and say this proves that this is four billion years old or this one's four and a half and five billion years old. The explanation for all of that is God's power in the universal destroy of the flood in destroying all of mankind. And we need to appreciate that about that. And that gives us a different age of the earth, doesn't it? Because we don't have that decay rate over a long period of time, but rather all smushed together, if I can use that word, just crammed into a time frame. So scientists come up with big numbers like 4 billion, 5 billion, and all those kinds of things. Speaking of that, let me mention this to you. You've heard that the earth is 4.5 to 5 billion. Is that what they teach in science class now, at roughly that, that time frame, 4.5, 5 billion? I think that's what most science books say. Huntsville, Alabama is not too far from here. You've been down to the Space Center. You've been down there, go through that exhibit. That lunar thing that landed on the moon the first time, you know, it's got those big stilts on it that compress and move. You know why? The brilliant people at NASA, and they are brilliant, 
because they understood that the earth is four and a half or five billion years of age, said there is about four to five feet of lunar dust on the moon. The earth, the earth and the moon being that old, the dust settles and that's, the scientists can measure it. It's about two point something inches per year of stuff out of the atmosphere, out of the solar system, land on the moon every year and it doesn't get blown away in no wind so it just piles up. So they were thinking that when they landed that module up there, those men were going to be walking up in about this much dust. And they'll be stepping through that dust. They got up there, and those men stepped off, and the dust layer was two and a quarter inches thick. Oh, the earth's five billion years old. It's supposed to be four and a half feet. But it was only two and a quarter. I saw some pictures on television the other night when they had a, a flyover of that thing here just a while back. You can still see the, the astronauts' footprints on the moon. Still, just like that. Because the earth is not five billion years of age. Another one. How many of you have been to Niagara Falls? A lot of water in 186,000 gallons per minute, I believe, across there. The scientists have measured that the Niagara Falls goes back, because of the force of the water, three feet every year. This year it's right here, but because of the force of the water, it's going to be right back to here. Three more years, uh, another year it's going to be three feet further back. So it's going further upstream. That's why in the 1950s and 60s they put some big pipes in there and they shut, shut the, they open those up at night so the water can go through there so that the Niagara Falls is not destroyed. Scientifically proven three feet a year. So that means we move it this way. What if you went back all right, in the year 1990, what was it? Well, you move it upstream three feet. Makes sense? If the earth is four and a half billion years of age, you would have to move it upstream 13 and a half billion feet. The only problem is 13 and a half billion feet is 100 times the circumference of planet Earth. Silly. Ridiculous. Because the Earth is not four and a half billion years of age. The time factor that we must appreciate in that. And so we don't have to accept everything that science tells us. If science can prove it, we will believe it and accept it. Talking about the idea of evolution. Again, the concept of science is it's a growing, getting bigger. We're going to get more advanced. Well, how, how come in all these years that we've been here on planet Earth as people, we haven't seen ourselves get any better? We're still about the same height, same weight. Those things change a little bit, but not very much. We're not evolving into something greater. They want us to believe that our great-great-grandfather was a monkey or a chimpanzee, but then we stopped at us. Why? Why don't we keep evolving and getting better and smarter more whatever? That idea you see of evolving. You ever see a woodpecker? How does he get into a tree? How does he get his food? Uh, 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 uh. How come he doesn't break his neck when he's beating on a tree? We used to have, live in a house that had asbestos siding. They'd come in every morning and beat on the asbestos siding. Da, 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 da. How come the woodpecker never did break his neck? Go back in your science book and you'll see that the attachment from the beak to the cranium in a woodpecker is different from every other bird that there is. Question. How did the woodpecker evolve? How many birds fell over on the ground dead because they broke their necks? Now, I don't mean to be silly, but you see the point. They could not evolve over millions of years. Did one get one cell that attached the beak to the, to the skull bone and another one got two and three... We've got brains, folks. God gave them to us for a purpose. So that we can use them and understand. And so we don't have to fall into the tra trap of believing everything that science tells us. There's a place in Southern California, down from Los Angeles, a few miles, called Capistrano. There's a Catholic mission that was set up there by the Spanish uh, monks in, back in the 16th, 17th century. Every year... On March the 19th, the Capistranos come back to Capistrano. I'm sorry? The, sw the Swallows. The Swallows come back to Capistrano. Remember the song, When the Swallows Come Back to Capistrano? I, I knew that. Okay. Are any of them carrying a GPS? Any of them got a calendar in the pocket that shows today's the day we got to get there? That's ludicrous, isn't it? The Swallows come back to Capistrano. 
How come the Blue Jays don't go to Capistrano? Or the Cardinals? Or the Robins? Because God made them that way. And they know when March 19th is. They were doing it before March 19th. It was called March 19th. The more you look at nature, the more you look at this great world in which we live and the solar system in which we live, the more you see it proves God. Because I don't have to say, well, I wonder, I guess, it could have happened, it might have happened. Uh, Scientists hypothesize. No. I've got a book that tells me. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Again, the word create means to bring into existence from nothingness. Anybody can start with something and make something else. God started with nothing and made it all. And the beauty of it is, it still works by God's perfect design. Yes, the law of thermodynamics still works. We're going downhill. God did not make this universe to exist forever. He gave us something that no other animal has. What is that? A soul. You read the creation in chapter 1. God made this, He made that, He made the, the, the sun, the moon, the stars, the trees, the animals, the beasts, the field, creeping things. He made all those things. But chapter 2 verse 7 says, And God breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. That differentiates man from everything else that God ever made. That's the point we must completely understand and appreciate. And people will say to me, You actually believe that stuff? You have faith in that? And I say, yes, with all my heart. And then I want to hand them this book and say, you see all these mites, maybes, could have, might have, and you place your faith in that? You see the difference, ladies and gentlemen? And that's why I say, everything that science can believe, can, can prove, follows the test of proving, we can understand and we can accept it. But science cannot explain the origin of life. Again, Brother Dicus' song, God holds that germ within his hand. Though men may search, they cannot find. It is not in man's ability to reason, think, or do to come up with God. If I ask you today to describe God, there are no words, are there? We've got dictionaries with 150,000 words in them. Can you find a word that explains God? Just one. Supernatural. That which is above the natural. Science can explain the natural, but science should not be in the business of trying to explain the supernatural. When I go to math class, I want to learn about math. I don't want to learn about Shakespeare. When I go to English class, I don't want to learn about math. They have their own areas of expertise. The expertise of origins of the world and everything in it will not be found in science. God did not give us that knowledge. He did not give us that information. What information he has given us is exactly right. And nothing science ever proves will disprove the Bible. And again, that says we, it's about time for us to close, I know. We'll, we'll understand this point. Everything that science can prove, I have no problem accepting. Science has made great strides. The fact that we can take astronauts and put them in outer space and bring them back safely. That's a great marvel. But it's not a miracle. It's just man's use of his abilities that God gave him. But when it comes to the origins of life, then God is the answer. And you see, if you don't believe that and you've bought into the idea of evolution and we're just highly developed animals... Well, like the old saying goes, what about the future? He's just like Rover. When he's dead, he's dead all over. That's the end of physical life. How futile our lives would be if that were the case. Oh, and we're seeing that right now in the way people treat each other on planet Earth. And the way people laugh and scoff at God. And because they think we came from animals, we started treating each other like animals. You see that every day on the news, don't you? Because we have begun to think 
like the animal kingdom as opposed to thinking of the spiritual kingdom. I did not hear a bell. It's, it's 945. Is that when you're supposed to quit? Or is it, it's, it, oh, okay. Okay, good, good, good. Okay. Keep, keep rolling. All right. But the, the fundamental thing we want to do is appreciate that. And again, look with me in Genesis chapter 7. Let my wife know I did hear that. Genesis chapter 7, verse 6. Noah was 600 years old when the floods, flood of waters was on the ark. And he goes on to talk about he goes into that ark. You go down and th- read through that verse number 11. In the 600th year of Noah's life, notice the preciseness of the Bible. In the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day where all the fountains of the deep opened up and the windows of heaven were opened and it rained, the rain was upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. And you go on and keep reading down through there in the rest of that chapter and it will give you some dates and times. And look over in chapter 8, verse number four, uh, 13. 8.13, and it came to pass in the 601st year, in the first month, and the first day of the month. See the exact preciseness of it? The waters were dried up from off the earth, and Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, and behold, the face of the ground was dry. And in the second month, on the seven and twentieth day of the month, the earth dried, and God spake to Noah and said, Noah and said, Go forth. Math class. How long was Noah on the ark? One year and ten days. 375 days. God gave us exact numbers, precise numbers. Well, this flood could have been four and a half billion years. You see the difference? That's why I continue to say, and I want you to believe, and if you leave this class with this today, that which science can prove will never contradict the Bible. That which science hypothesizes about, theorizes about, may be in contradiction. So when it comes to the final choice, Here's the book that tells me the origin of life. This book guesses about the origin of life, but it cannot prove it. I can prove my statement, and I can prove my position from the words of the Bible. You young folks are facing a difficult challenge today in the world in which you're growing up. You're going to be laughed at and scoffed at and called all kinds of names for being a Christian, for believing that there's no such thing as evolution, that God created the world in six days. You'll have to stand there and take that. But never let it change what's in your heart and your mind from your knowledge of the Word of God that you know to be true. Thank you. 